I have are the things that I can buy. And I had enough chemistry to just be a little bit dangerous. And I had enough people to come in and say, I want pear, I want plumeria, I want freesia, I want these things that you don't have. Do you know where we can get them or can you get them and sell them here? And you really couldn't buy anything wholesale from Bath and Body Works because they're owned by the limited corporation. And same thing with, you know, the body shop was just too expensive. So I thought, you know, I can do this. And so my kids will testify. I, I picked four fragrances, cooked up the brews in the kitchen, literally, made the kids come home from school. It was slave labor. They would pump them every night in the bottles. I went down to Labels Express and had labels printed up. And I had my little bottles that I'd put on the front table every day. And before you knew it, I had, I had eight SKUs, four lotions, four shower gels. Those eight SKUs were outselling the entire store. And so I'm like, wow, you know, this is really cool. And at this point, I'm still like, I'm just my little shop, raise my girls, this is fun. My kids were mall rats. We had bean bag chairs in the back of the mall and the videos and that watch. And they were all running the cash register. And, you know, it was really fun. So anyway, I had my eight SKUs. And then one day, Jack Lee walked into my store. He flew over from Denver, which is something he never did. And he took me by surprise. And he stopped at the front of the store. And he was looking at my lotions and shower gels. And then I'm like, oh, shoot, Jack Lee's here. Maybe he's mad I'm not buying as much stuff. And so I go walking to the front of the store to meet with Jack. And he's picking up the lotions and kind of looking at them and checking them out and really quiet for a while. And then he goes, next time you print your labels, leave University Mall off of this because when you go national, you're not wanting that on there. And it was like, he put this seed in my mind that was like, oh my gosh, you know what? I'm going to go national. And I seriously, he put that in my mind to the point that all through 1996, I was like, I'm going national. I'm going national. And I was just like, you know, this is what I'm going to do. So I'm like, if I'm going to go national, I need to plan to go national. So I found a cosmetic chemist in San Francisco. And I'm like, it's probably time I quit cooking up all this stuff in the kitchen and slave laboring my kids. So um, I hired this chemist, and I went out and spent two weeks in his lab. And we developed 64 SKUs that were all natural, no mineral oil, no alcohol, no lanolin, anything like that. It was just lotion, shower gel, splashes, bubble baths, anything that you could you know, and then we launched them in the store of November of 1996. And it was like, it just took off, it exploded, it went crazy. And all of a sudden, I wasn't selling anybody else's stuff. It was just all my own label. And then at the beginning of 1997, um, we launched it on a national level and started selling it wholesale throughout the country. And so before you knew it, we had 15 wholesale showrooms throughout the US in all the World Trade Centers. and the merchandise marts throughout the U.S., and we had 150 reps selling for us. So by the beginning of 1998, we were completely national all the way. And we were doubling in size every single year. So one of the things that I learned is once you're big and you're national and you have a great year, you've got to keep repeating it. You've got to anniversary those numbers. You've got to have new stuff. You've got to be competitive. You've got to, you've got to always be doing new. And so... Um, Every show, every January, when you launch the new season, you have to have new stuff. So we were developing new products all the time. And it was kind of a fluke. In um, 1999, I decided, I want to put a few candles with these lotions. And so we had eight fragrances at the time. And so I hired a company in Utah that was a candle manufacturer to um, pour eight candles for me. And I'm like, these are the Pantone colors I want them. These are the fragrances. This is what I want. And we had a deal. We signed a contract. And then the night before they were supposed to launch them, or the, start pouring the candles, they call me up and they're like, I'm not going to pour your candles for you because our biggest customer feels like you're their biggest competitor. And I don't want to lose my biggest customer. And so I'm like, hmm, OK. You just put me in the candle business. And so I went and bought a tank. And at this point, you guys, this is hilarious. We're living in the farm. My garage has all of a sudden become where I'm storing stuff. So the cars are now kicked out. The barn across the street, I cemented it. All six stalls were separate fragrance. Um, yeah, seriously, this is a joke. So that I could watch my kids and be mom, manage the wholesale business, all the supplies. So. Um, the barn's six stalls and six fragrances. And all of a sudden, I have this 
tank of, you know, pouring candles. And remember, my husband's one of the biggest apple farmers in the country at this point. So you go down the dirt road, and there's four big buildings. Well, I go kick him out of one of the buildings because it was the off-season for the apples. And I have the apple bins tipped upside down, and I've got the tank in the middle, and we're pouring candles on top of these apple bins, and all the people that were pruning are now pouring candles. It was hilarious, <laughs> to say the least. But anyway, we made our January lunch, and they were so successful. And so keeping with that, the next year I'm like, well, we've got to do more candles. We've got to do better because this is going great. And so then we came up with the home bake line. We launched that in 2000. And for those of you, I don't know if you've seen our candles or not, they're the ones that are most popular in a little nine ounce jar, like jam and jelly had come in. And we started with nine fragrances um, in that line. And they are keeping with the We Were All Natural Bath and Body. I wanted to have all natural candles. So we had soy wax candles before soy was cool, before, you know, and remember our bath and body was natural before bath and body was cool. But I wanted to be different. I wanted to stand out. I didn't want to be a normal candle company. And so I said, you know what? I'm going to do food fragrances and I'm going to put the cute little sprinkles on the top. So if you're looking at a blueberry candle, there's little blueberries on the top. Or if you're looking at a birthday cake candle, there's little birthday sprinkles on the top. And I remember going out and doing the national sales meeting for all my reps in these 15 wholesale showrooms and showed them this line. And I had this little wood hutch made so it looked like a little country hutch with these candles in it. And I'm like, this is going to be the best thing you guys have had to sell forever. They're like, no, this is never going to work. It's too Cracker Barrel. It's just it's not going to work. It's too country, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, the long short is that line ended up taking our company to $6 million that year. And it... Overnight, it was placed nationally in Kohl's and Kirkland's and Mervyn's and, you know, and all of a sudden, it put us in the candle business. So before you knew it, we were, it, it started going gradual. We were all of a sudden 50% candles and we're 60% candles. And today, we're the largest female-owned candle company in the country. So it's kind of funny that we started out in Bath and & Body and now we're candle company. We still do a little bit of Bath & Body, but not much. So it's kind of one of those things where we've gone to where the business is. So today we, um, we're a candle company. But So some of the things that I wanted to tell you about that I've learned along the way. Um, I had Jack Lee, who was my mentor, back in the beginning at the retail store. But we were at um, Atlanta is the biggest out of all the wholesale shows. And Atlanta is where all the trends are launched. And pretty much anything that you can buy anywhere is sold in one of these wholesale marts. So Atlanta is the biggest. So we were in the showroom doing a show there. And Steve Helveston is a guy that owned the showroom that was there. And I remember him coming up to me after um, one of the shows had been really successful. We were wrapping it up. And it was like one of the biggest writing shows we had ever had. And he goes, what are you going to do next? And I'll never forget him saying that. And he owned the showroom. And it was the biggest showroom in this. this you have to understand how big this place is. It's four buildings. And it's like 18 or 19 floors each building. And each floor is just full of stuff that you can buy. So out of all these showrooms, he owned the biggest one. And I just remember saying to him, I'm going to be as big as you are. And he goes, really? And I go, yeah. And then he goes, what are you doing to get there? And it was kind of like that wake up call, that awe moment where you go, what am I doing to get there? And so it, it just kind of opened up the door for me to say, huh, I need a mentor like you. Can I sit down with you and find out what you did to get to where you are? And the thing that he told me is he said, just dream big, but you got to execute on the dream. You can't just let it go. And so I ended up sitting down with Steve probably every six months for the next couple of years. And he was kind of like that mentor that really helped me go, you know what, I can dream, but i got to put action into it. So that was one of the, the really fun things that, that he taught me. In fact, he's the one that opened up the door to China for me. So I ended up going to China in 1999. And today now we have offices in Bangkok, Thailand, and or Bangkok, Thailand, Vietnam, and Xiamen, China. And he's the guy that helped me go there the first time. So we've been able to take out layers out of our supply chain by putting our own people on the ground there and not having to go through all the different people. And that would have never happened had I not 
had that conversation with him and had he not spent the time to help mentor me. So some of the other uh, lessons I've learned on my um, way to get my degree in the School of Hard Knocks, as I call it. You can do, be, and have it all, but the number one thing that is the most important thing that you can do is time management, okay? Time is the most important thing that you have. And you will absolutely miss 100% of the shots that you don't take. And the only way that you're going you're gonna to do it is with time management. So you just have to go, you know what? There is nothing more important than today. And we all have the same 24 hours in every day. And do you ever wonder why some people make it and some people don't? It's like, what are you doing with it? So time management is probably one of the most crucial things that you will ever learn or do to be successful at some of the things that you've got to do to execute. So you say, what I'm doing right now today, is it the best use of my time? What I'm doing this minute, is it getting me closer to the goals that I have? So one of the things that I tell my employees all the time is productivity is the deliberate strategic investment of your own time, talent, intelligence, energy, resources, and opportunities in a manner calculated to move you measurably closer to meaningful goals. So you've got to absolutely be able to manage your time and put it where it's most important. One of the things I like to still get a lot of motivational things through the internet, like Brian Tracy, if you go to his website, he'll send you little tidbits of motivational things every day. He'll also give you newsletters on business and entrepreneurship. And one of the things that he says is, typically people spend 20% or you get 80% of your work done in 20% of your time. Have you noticed that? Like when you're in stress or crunch, you get the most done. So he said, what if you spent 80% of your time doing the 20% of the things that you do the very best? Just focus your strength on that. And Marcus Buckingham, Marcus Buckingham also writes a lot of books on focusing your strength and putting your energy on what you do best and, and where you're at. The other thing that I think is, is just as important as time management is you've got to have passion. You've absolutely got to love what you do. Who wants to go to work and do something they don't like? I say I get to go to work every day and play and get paid. What I do doesn't feel like a job to me because I love it that much. It's so much fun. So you've got to have passion and you've got to build a passionate team around you. And you want to paint your vision in absolutely living color so everybody understands it. And they all know and understand that that's what the goal is and that you're so passionate about it that, that, you feel your, that you surround yourself with a team that can be just as passionate as you are that can help you move because vision without action is nothing more than a daydream. It's absolutely not. So an action without vision is nothing more than a nightmare. So you want to have as much passion and, and share your vision with the team. Another thing that you want to always do, and this is something that you can never quit doing if you want to be successful, and that is you have to read. You have to read all the time. It's something I still haven't stopped doing, and I haven't been in school for 26 years. You have to read, you have to listen, and you have to learn all the time. You have to read to succeed. You have to know your competition. Like for me now, my typical day, I subscribe to three newspapers. I read the Wall Street Journal, the New York Post, and the Salt Lake Tribune every single day. I get up at 5.30 in the morning and turn on CNBC because I want to know how the stock market's doing. I want to know how all my competitors are doing. I want to know where their stock's at. I want to know what their CEOs are up to. And I subscribe to 30 magazines a month, anything from trends to finance to whatever, because you absolutely have to know what your competition is doing to be successful. You've got to be ahead of the curve. One of the things right now, our, one of our biggest competitors is Yankee Candle. and. Um, you know, just from reading the news and, and watching the stock market and kind of following what they're doing, you know, I, I study their financials. Right now in a down economy, they have $1.2 billion in debt. They haven't paid a principal payment in two years. So it's like, what does that tell me? Anybody have any ideas? No, they didn't. But if I want to be a smart entrepreneur and I want to sweep into where they're at, I'm going to study what are their biggest accounts. What's going to happen when they can't pay their bills? What's going to happen when they file for a reorganizational bankruptcy and they, they stiff their wax vendors and their oil vendors? 
if I am ready to sweep in to their biggest accounts and deliver product to fill their shelves when they can't, farther ahead. But, you know, it may not happen, but it may, and I'm ready, and I'm willing, and I'm able to sweep in and take some of their business. So those are some of the kind of the things that you learn. You also want to know what your competitors are selling. You want to know what they're doing. And like our industry, it's not just an industry where you make something up. It's like, did you ever wonder how when you're walking the mall and you go, okay, everyone's wearing orange this year, or everyone's wearing blue this year? Or why are all the stores that aren't even part of each other consistently kind of the same trends? Do you ever notice that? If you pay attention to fashion trends, like how do they know to take a women's suit from the long look that used to be into the short? Or, you know, different things like that? Well, the trends start in Europe and they start in fashion and then they go to fragrance and then they go to tabletop. And so if I want to know what's going to be popular here, I want to watch the trends in Europe. So like what's, what's popular in Europe or at the Asian shows is going to be popular here in maybe a year. And so you want to be on top of all of that. So there's so much that you can learn by, by staying on top of your competition and by learning and by reading and by studying them. One of the things that I like to tell my employees, and this is how we start a lot of our staff meetings, I will we'll go around the room before we start, and I'll say, what do you know about our business this week that you didn't know last week? And they all, it's, it's kind of fun to go into these meetings because they all go to the internet and search, like what are our competitors doing and what are we doing? What do we know about them this week that we didn't know last week? What do you know this week that you didn't know last week about a competitor? What do you know this week that you didn't know about our industry as a whole? This is really fun to hear some of the stuff that they come up with. What do you know this week that you didn't know last week about a customer? It's amazing what you start digging for. What do you know this week that you didn't know last week about our top 10 customers? What do you know this week that you didn't know last week about a top leader in your field? I'll tell you how I've learned a lot of the stuff I've learned is by reading biographies of successful people. You can never read too much. Read about successful people and follow what they do. Emulate the things that make them work, that have worked. And what do you know this week that you did not know about a social trend, a cultural trend, or an economic trend that will affect our industry? These are all things, if you're, if you're watching and listening, that you can learn. Okay, one of the other lessons that I learned, always have a plan B. And you know, you hear that, and the military people talk about it a lot, but it is true. And you know, you never think about worst case scenario, but you really have to. And I've seen a lot of things happen in the last 14 years that I never thought I would see. One of the things that I, needed to have a plan B on. All of you remember Hurricane Katrina? Okay, so I'm watching the news and I'm going, hmm, I'm so sick of hurricanes. It was the year we had a ton of them. And I remember, because I keep CNBC muted on, in my office all day long, so I can kind of watch the market and they kept interrupting it for news stories. Oh, Katrina, Katrina. And I remember seriously going, I am so sick of seeing reporters in there raincoats and blah, 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 blah. I turned it off, okay? Never in a million years did I stop and think, wow, maybe I should pay attention to Katrina. Because guess what? Katrina ended up biting me in the butt in big time. Katrina happened in the Gulf. What do I use that comes out of the Gulf? Wax. It's a derivative of fuel. And Katrina completely shut my supply chain down my supply chain down completely and so we were going into peak season and I couldn't get wax and I'm like wow I should have paid a whole lot more attention to Katrina and what was going on and realized every other candle company in the country was going to be in the same boat and had a contingency plan what I ended up doing is going to Toronto to get wax and I was lucky that we were large enough that they took our orders above most of our competitors. But that's one of the things that absolutely could have put us to a grinding halt at a peak season. And I was a little bit slow jumping on it. Thank goodness we came out of it okay. 
but it was one that scared me to death, and it's one that could have put us out of business. Another one that happened was, um, I don't know if you guys remembered or not, but the UPS um, went on strike, and that completely shut down our delivery. And FedEx wouldn't take any new customers because they were offended that you were with UPS and you weren't with FedEx, so they were supporting their FedEx customers. So I ended up having to go, and thank goodness it's when we were smaller and not shipping thousands of packages a day, but I could fill my car full of packages and go to the U.S. Post Office and send it, but you had to wait in line for hours to send it, and that's kind of what I did every day. Had I paid more attention to that one, I would have opened up an account with FedEx before and had kind of a contingency plan there. But there was one that I scored big on, and that was when the docks coming out of LA went on strike, okay? We are one of the largest importers in the state of Utah because we bring in so many containers of glass because all of our glass that we pour our camels in comes out of China. And so I had wind that they were going to go on strike because I watched the news and read so many newspapers. And it was something that I was like, you know, if they go on strike and I can't get my containers in here, I'm not gonna be able to deliver for Christmas. And so I kind of calculated it out and planned ahead, and I'm like, okay, I have my revolving line of credit. You know, and the way it works, you get your container in, you wire the money to China, and you're, when you deal with the bank and get a line of credit, you work out, okay, here's my budget for the year, here's what I think I'm gonna do, so they give you a certain line of credit. Well, I figured out if I bought all of my wax, or all of my glass early, that I wouldn't be getting money in, and it would, it would max out my line of credit, and it would, put me in trouble because I wouldn't have cash to do payroll and pay for wax and all that kind of stuff. But I thought it was a risk I was worth taking. So I went ahead and ordered 60 containers of glass. This is all of the glass that I'm going to need for the Christmas season to pour candles. This is 60 40 foot containers. And I went to the bank and I said, I'm going to go out on a limb and I'm going to order these containers before they go on strike because I want to know I have them in and I'm going to max out my line of credit and I need you to back me up and give me a bigger line of credit. And they're like, you're crazy. And I'm like, I don't care. I think the risk is worth it. And so I pushed, I pushed. And uh, they let me have the money and I got all the containers in. And our building there in Linden, we're off Geneva Road in Linden, our parking lot was so full of containers you could not park in the back. It was hilarious. And everyone kept going, you're crazy. And I'm like, no, wait and see, wait and see. And you know what? They went on strike, and those ports were shut down for two months. I'm not kidding, two months. And what ended up happening, I was able to deliver every single one of my orders. Kohl's department store, which is one of our biggest accounts, their own import line, which is if you take their candle department, probably 60% of their candle department is their own import line. They couldn't even get their own stuff. So Kohl's is calling me up going, we need stuff for our shelves. We can't get anything in. And I'm like, I'll deliver. You know? So we ended up doubling in size. It was worth it. And we went through every single container. It was great. So had I not watched the news, had I not read the newspapers, and had I not had a plan B for that scenario. So I say, once you graduate from the School of Hard Knocks, you don't go back for the master's. So as you learn each thing, you go on to remember and execute it. So one of the things that I've learned is always have a plan B for any worst case scenario that you're seeing come along that could affect you. So. One of the other things that um, I like to follow, um, it's the fast that eat the slow, not the big that eat the small. You can wait around, you know, you have a good idea, and if you wait and you wait long enough, somebody else will do it. So that's kind of our mantra. We even have uh, a cheetah on our slideshows for our staff meetings that, you know, it's the fast that eat the slow, it's not the big that eat the small. And um, we flew under the radar for a really long time with a lot of our competitors. They didn't know who we were and then all of a sudden we came out because when something happened we were quick to market because we followed trends and watched them and, and our model is execute quickly when you see a trend coming. So that's one of the things that we like to live by. And, and one of the things that um, I read from Pat Croce, he said, deals do die, promises are broken, sales are stolen, love is lost and opportunities will vanish while you wait and wonder what happened to that great or small something that you meant to do, that you never did. So you wanna always be ready to go. And he said along with that, he says, I spent a fortune on a trampoline, a stationary bike, and a rowing machine. 
complete with gadgets to read my pulse and gadgets to proof my progress results and others to show the miles I had charted, but they left off the gadget to get me started. I thought that was cute. I've always remembered that one. So as he said, and as I say, you want to take action. You want to take action on the great idea or execute it because, do you ever wonder? Somebody else does. So um, one of the things that I always like to say, and stealing this one from Wayne Gretzky, I like to go where the hockey puck is going to be, not where it's at. And that is why we moved into candles. That's why we've done some of the business decisions that we've done, because we, we look at the business now. You want to look at the past. You want to look at now. But you want to look at the future. And you want to go, where is it going? You want to always be willing to move in that direction. And like one of the things that has happened to us, the bigger we've got, um, and the more key accounts that we work with, like for instance, our largest account is Kohl's, as I said before. But when I started shipping to Kohl's eight years ago, they had 267 stores. They have like 1,500 or close to it now. So they've got so large. So what happens with that, they start putting demands on you that they didn't before. Like they'll say, oh, the economy was really bad this past Christmas and we didn't make our margin. So in order for you to get your next order, you need to pay us so much money in markdown money so we can make our margin. I'm like, what about my margin? You know, these are some of the things that you deal with as the business gets larger and you have bigger accounts. They pretty much control what you do. So one of the things that we have done strategically in the last couple of years, we launched a new division of our business. It's a spinoff and it's called For Every Home and it's a direct sales division. So it's a way for women is kind of like the Mary Kay model or the Avon model for women to be able to make money in their home and sell and it makes us more diversified it makes us more healthy and long term it's been a really good move for us because we had a 6x growth last year in a down economy and we have a 6x growth forecasted this year because as the economy goes down people lose jobs and they're looking for other ways to make money so that was a really good move that we made strategically that will help us grow long term in the end. And we're projecting that that business will um, be as large as for everybody is it that took 14 years to get at the end of three years that business will be as big as for everybody is. So we're really, really excited about that. But that's one of the things with part of go where the hockey puck is going to be instead of where it's at. So you want to always kind of be looking ahead because there's so many companies that get they reach a certain level and they get so laid back and lackadaisical because they think they've made it and they don't keep their eye on the ball and they don't keep their eye on the competitors and they don't keep their eye on the economy or the marketplace and they go down. And it's really sad how many of them are going down now in this down economy. So you don't want to be there. Another lesson that I have learned, and this was a big one for me, you cannot get emotional in business stilling. You cannot make long-term decisions based on emotion. And you cannot, um, if you're in a meeting negotiating or whatever, you can't take it personal or get emotional. And I learned this one by the School of Hard Knocks, and I swore I'd never do it again, and I never have. And sometimes it's a little bit harder being female to not show your emotion. <laughs> But on the flip side, if it's your business and it's your livelihood, it's like one of my kids and I'm going to defend it. But I was in a big, huge meeting with Coles. This was probably four years ago. And it was one of those meetings where they were giving me their year-end numbers. And um, I got a little bit ticked off because she handed me the spreadsheet. And it's just me and our rep and four Coles people across. And... Um, she handed me her spreadsheet of the numbers and she says, I need a million dollars in markdown money. And I'm like, are you kidding me? You know, and I got mad. I wasn't just shocked. I got really mad. And I said, you're going to flip and put me out of business. Who can stroke a check for a million bucks when I've just sold you all this stuff? And because you guys put it on sale, your problem is not my problem. And I mean, I got a little ticked off and a little bit too wound up. And I even got up and walked out of the meeting. Okay, that's a big no, folks. Okay? And um, we ended up getting in the car, and I went to the airport and flew home. 
And I'll tell you, I ended up on a plane three days later groveling because what ended up happening, that buyer went to our rep and said, I'm not going to do business with them anymore. And it just made me realize, you know, because it was like my business and it was such a big, huge shock and, you know, she got a little defensive with me and I got a little defensive with her and it just, anyway, a whole lot more to it than just she handed me the thing, I got ticked off. But it, instead of really getting to the root and coming up with a solution that was win-win, I reacted with emotion. And I have never, ever done that since. And I'll tell you, there's been times I've wanted to walk out and go in the bathroom and cry, but I haven't. You suck it up, you smile, you say what you have to do, and you treat them with respect. And then if you have to walk away and work out a solution and then go back, it's better than to show your emotion there because it was the biggest wake-up call for me because I thought, okay, so what I really should do is put a pencil to it, sit down with my CFO, work out something that works for us, that works for them, that maybe meets in the middle somewhere so that I don't learn, lose the business. So if I say, okay, I'm not going to stroke a check for them for markdowns, but then I lose the Kohl's business, where am I? Where's my 200 employees? They, or they're going to be laid off if I don't have that business. So that was probably one of the hardest and the fastest lessons that I learned that I swore I would never do again and I never have. And along with that is you absolutely cannot take personal because it's business. And I've learned a lot of this from Donald Trump reading his books too because he's a big advocate of you cannot take it personal, it's business. And so it's like, okay, the Coles buyer, she just wanted to make her numbers, I want to make my numbers, and it's not personally directed as an attack to me, but it's more, you know, and what I did is I took it personal, I showed emotion, and that was a big mistake. But I corrected it, and thank goodness we fixed it because Coles is still one of our biggest our biggest um, customers and you know one of those things with taking it personal too um, is we were growing and you learn you go along there was an issue with my employees they wanted their sick time to not carve into their vacation time and so three or four people come in and approach me on it spokespeople for the group you know we want vacation time we want sick time we want them separated and if we don't use the sick time we want to be able to take it blah 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 and I just remember kind of at that time going, you know, maybe I could have taken it personal too, but I didn't. Going back to the lesson I learned at Coles, I listened to him. Seek first to understand. Covey, one of his biggest. That's an incredible book for you guys too if you're thinking about, actually for anything, entrepreneur, personal, whatever. His life laws there are great. And then the seek first to understand is a great one. So I listened to the employees and ended up changing the policy the way they wanted it, the vacation and sick policy, because once I put myself in the position they were, removed it and said, okay, I'm not going to take this personal. This is just people. It's their lives. This is their job. They've dedicated their life to me and my company. I want to make sure I take care of them. So I was glad I learned that lesson. Another one, too, that I've learned the larger we are, you absolutely have to delegate. You have to know when to let go, and you have to know when to pass it to someone else and trust them. So you can't just delegate. You have to delegate with conviction, and you have to follow up. And you have to know what your own strengths are, and that's where you spend your time. And then you hire the best people around you and let them focus on their strengths. I am a huge, huge fan of Marcus Buckingham. Do, have any of you read any of his books? His biggest one, Focus on Your Strengths. He's written probably seven or eight. He's based all his books on the Gallup polls. He worked at Gallup polls for a long time. And they spent a lot of time going in and studying people. And it's like, you want to focus on what you do best because, and he used the scenario of parents. Their kids come home and, and the kid has a report card and they have five A's and a D. What's the first thing the parent says? Well, why'd you get the D? Well, what are you doing? Immediately focusing on the negative with that kid. And so instead of focusing on the D, it's like, oh my goodness, look how good you did. You got five A's. This is so incredible. Now, what can we do to work? You know, you kind of focus on the strengths. And it's like if you focus on the strengths with your employees, with yourself, you do better. You get more done. You get more executed. So one of the things that was really hard for me to do because I had such a financial background, um, I did all of our accounting for a really long time. And it was one of those things where I'm like, oh, I have to do my own books. I have to know the numbers. I have to trust them that everything is going to be great. And it probably held me back a little longer than it should have because I was spending all night doing books after working all day. And when I finally gave it up and hired a CFO, and that's what he did, 
and that I trusted him to do his job and bring me the numbers. It's incredible how that freed me up. And it, but it took me a long time to learn that lesson. And so that's one that I've um, tried to always remember too, is just hire the best and put them around you and focus on their strengths. And you empower the people that you have around you to make decisions. And then probably the last lesson and the most important, you have to manage your money or it will manage you. And I remember my first large order that I got. I called my dad and I'm like, Dad, you won't believe it. I got this huge order and we're going to make this much. And he goes, it doesn't matter how much you sell. It's how much you make. What is the bottom line? You have to manage your money. You have to watch it and you have to focus on it. We all can't be Walmart. Their model is 10% off cost and then they cover everything in the 10%. If we're all doing 10% off cost, you're not going to make it. So you've got to absolutely manage your money. So it doesn't matter how much. And sometimes you have to sacrifice for the short term results for long term based on the financial. You want to really look it over and not make stupid decisions. One of the mistakes I could have made early on that I didn't, it's like when we started getting a lot of attention on the national market, we had Bath and Body Works come to us. And remember, Bath and Body Works is the one that I watched in the beginning that I wanted to emulate and be just like them. Well, we were in Atlanta working a trade show and our booth was all set up with candles and uh, the ba Bath and Body Works chemist came in and their head of R&D came into our booth. And they said, you know what, we have a problem. It's when they had their white barn division. Now they've kind of blended white barn into Bath and Body Works. So the candles that are in Bath and Body Works were made under the white barn label. But it's when they had the, actually they still do have the glass with the silver lid. And it had three wicks in it. They said, we absolutely cannot get this candle to burn right. And we're having a huge, huge return rate. And they said, if you can fix this and make it burn right, we will give you all of our candle business for the Bath and Body Works chain. And I remember being so excited. And at the time, we didn't have a white barn in Utah, still don't, never have. But I was in Atlanta, so I got in a cab and went to the mall. And I remember buying probably $300 worth of samples and FedExing them home to our R&D lab. And I'm like, you guys, work around the clock, fix this problem. And it was probably two weeks later we had a solution and we had their candle so it could burn perfect. And so um, we met with our R&D people and they gave us a contract and I was so excited. I'm like, oh my gosh, this is who I loved and who I wanted to emulate and now I get to do their business. I can't believe this. But then as I got reading their contract and I had my lawyer look at it and I had my CFO look at it and we started going through it, I'm like, this is not a good deal for me. This is a good deal for them. And they absolutely would not budge on it. And it was one of those things where I'm like, you know what, I could do this. And I could say, yeah, I poured all their candles and it would be huge business for us. But at the end of the day, if the bottom line isn't there and it's not a profitable win-win for both sides, it's not worth it. And that is one of the hardest things I've ever had to do, but I walked away, walked away. So didn't take the business. So that was one of the things that, uh, I learned that the short-term results were not worth the long-term what it would have done to us financially, tying up our cash flow for a small margin just to say we had it. Question? Oh, scratching back. Do have a question? So anyway, basically what I was going to say is it's okay to fight for what's right and to walk away from business that isn't good because at the end of the day, it's about making money. It's about being profitable. So there you have it. It was hard. It really was. And uh, I have a daughter sitting back there. She'll know. I'll tell you. I took a lot of red eyes home from shows. Um, I walked away from, I shouldn't say I walked away from, I didn't take a lot of business that I probably could have taken. Like we're a $30 million company now. And I would say most of that growth has come in the last, my baby's 21, probably in the last four to five years. Because I wanted to be there for their stuff. That is the one thing I wanted to do is to be able to look back without regrets and say I made most of the stuff. I did take red eyes home to watch girls get picked up for prom or to not miss a basketball tournament. 
but you know it, it's a give and take it really is and it's a difficult one and you talk to any mother who's has a career they will have the same one there's certain things that I did do I kept my office at home for as long as I could do um, I worked on a blackberry a lot I learned how to multitask like crazy like it, uh, the magazines and stuff that I read I would rip out articles have them in my purse so if I'm sitting in the parking lot waiting for the kids I I learned to make the most of downtime and I, when my kids were in high school at Provo High, I rented an office that was right there so they could pop over after school or at lunch. And, and for a lot of years, I left work at 2.30 as we moved off the farm and into an office so that I could be home when they got home. It's got more difficult as the kids have got older, but they're all older and nobody lives at home anymore. So, you know, it, it was, it, it's a juggling act. And it's, it's a battle women are going to fight to the end of time. But it can be done, but with balance. So are you privately owned? We are. Do you find that was like, it seems like most entrepreneurs have to get a point where they get like funding. Do you find that was like a big obstacle for you in terms of growing your business? I'll tell you that one of the things that we've done is we've always tried to really manage the money and not take on a ton of debt. So we've managed a lot of the growth as we've come. The larger we've got, especially the IRI scan data, is, and that's when your UPCs go across the scanning machines. The big private equity companies get a hold of you know your data, and so I probably get two calls a week from private equity companies wanting to invest in us. But honestly, knock on wood, we haven't needed it so far because we've had good margins because we haven't taken the bad marginal business, and um, we've been okay. We've been okay. We've just kind of invested. But you're right. There is a point where a lot of them do that, and a lot of them are afraid to take funding because the fearful they don't understand what um, how private equity works in fact um, I didn't I have to honestly say I did not understand how private equity worked until I won the Ernst & Young um, the Ernst & Young award in 2006 the judge that came and interviewed me was um, a managing member of vSpring Capital and now he's the head of Mercado Capital and he was asking me all these questions as he's walking through the place and um, he kind of explained private equity to me and then a few months later he called and he said you know I have been at a judge with Ernst & Young for seven years he's been in private equity his entire life and the year that I won Ernst & Young there was probably three women that won typically you don't see women win but he said you know out of all the portfolios that I'm looking at these women owned companies we were all making more money see I always thought that we were really small. I always said we're the size of a fly on an elephant's butt compared to everyone else because I'm comparing myself to these big, huge corporations. But we're really big compared to most small businesses. I mean, when you hit that $30 million mark or the $20 million mark, to me, I had nothing to compare it to. I didn't know. And so he put together a group of us women who have um, won the Ernst & Young Entrepreneur that have big businesses that have crossed the $20 million mark. And we have formed a private equity company called Vast Equity, and it's women entrepreneurs who are investing in women entrepreneurs. And it wasn't until I joined that private equity group and realized, so here I'm a private equity managing member, but yet I'm, uh, I haven't invested in private equity. And it's so funny as we tell the stories and interview companies that want us to invest in them, the perception of private equity and what you think because it's like I always ignored those calls because I thought they're going to come in and take over my business and I will not own it anymore and not have control in reality that is not what they do there's a lot of things you can do around that where they can take a less than 50 percent thing but you're right private equity is a way to do financing and we we just haven't we've been lucky because we're privately held I was just wondering, was it hard to get international suppliers? Were there any obstacles you faced, or how did you pay for um, these? I'll tell you how we started. We started by walking the Canton Show in uh, Guangzhou, China, and we found it was just kind of a fluke the way I found our agent. Because typically, when you go to China, you get an agent who will represent you, and then they go through a trading company, and then that trading company goes direct to the factory, and so there's levels of margin they take out. So typically, you have three or four levels in the supply chain before you get it from China. But still, when you get it from China versus here, say I pay 10 cents for a jar in China, I would pay a dollar here. So even those layers in the supply chain, 
So it just started out with, I had an agent and I paid those four layers, but as we started getting larger and larger, I found that those layers were my margin that I could negotiate with the big key accounts where I could help them hit their margin. So I just started cutting layers out and we finally put an office over in China with our own Asian people that speak fluent Chinese and fluent English. So we've cut four layers out and we just go direct to the factory through our own offices. But it was in gradual steps to answer your question. So it, went, it started at the show with an agent and then you just keep cutting a layer out, a layer out, a layer out. Oh, he works for me. <laughs> Did I tell you that anywhere along the line? Yeah, it was one year later. The farm is gone. gone, yeah. It's hilarious. <laughs> yeah, that was fun. He got on board real quick. <laughs> he is president of the Asia Supply Chain. One of the things that we've had to do, though, the larger you get, you have to bring in talent from other places. Um, so we've brought in a lot of people in key positions, the larger we've got. But yeah, still there, still full time. When you had moments of complete desperation where you thought, I can't do this, what kind of things did you do to help yourself get out of that chain of thought? Um, yeah, I've had a few of those. Um, you just try to, I'll tell you one of the things I've really turned to, and my kids will testify to this. I'm a neurotic freak on motivational stuff. Tony Robbins, love him. He's in my car all the time. I don't watch TV. I spend a lot of time reading, and I try to balance a certain percentage of it in motivational and uplifting stuff. Because one of the things that I've learned, um, there are people to help you in every aspect and every issue. It's just picking up the phone and asking. And, you know, I, I say, I already have the no. I can get the yes. And worst case scenario, they say no. I ask. I'm not out anything. And so I have gone to people and asked them, hey, I have this problem. And you would be surprised. Competitors, everyone will help you. In fact, when we hit the $15 million mark, um, one of our largest competitors went out of business. And I'm just like, I wonder why. You know, I was going, I wonder why. And I thought, you know what, I'm going to call and ask them. And I picked up the phone and I said, I want to know why you went out of business. I, you're not a competitor anymore. And um, I would love to pick your brain. Let me fly to Utah, fly you to Utah, give you a free trip and spend a couple of days with you and tell me every mistake you made so I don't make it. And he did. He came out. And it was the best two days I've ever spent. I got more information out of him. And you know what? Had I not dared pick up the phone and ask, I would have probably made a lot of the mistakes he made. Because a lot of companies have a hard time going from the small size to the medium size. And it's just inexperience from the entrepreneurs. So I've learned there's somebody that knows. And just don't be afraid to ask. And then try to keep your mind full of positive stuff. Because you know what? This economy could really be the pits, and it is, and it, I hate it, and I won't lie, but you know what? One of the things that I've tried to tell myself, I'm going to embrace it, I'm going to love it, and I'm going to learn, because you know what? Stuff is happening last year and this year that will probably never, ever happen again, and I want to learn from it. So. How does technology play a role in your company? Oh my gosh, big time. Big time, and you know what? I went to, when I went to BYU, I'm not kidding, you guys are all with your little laptops and stuff. I had the manual. <laughs> The whiteout, up till 3 in the morning typing, and the professors wouldn't take the papers if you had one little whiteout thing. So technology was a really huge thing for me that was hard to embrace, but I've had to. And um, I've become a real pro with social media because that is a really big deal. But the um, IT has just been huge because the accounts, EDI, EDIs, when they give you the order and it comes through the electronic electronic data interchange into your system and it downloads right to our system. Blackberries, all of our officers and director level carry them so they can be responsive because going with it, it's the fast that eat the slow, not the big that eat the small. You've, you've got to be able to get your people that quick and you expect them to answer and yeah, we do. We all carry Blackberries. We, technology has been a big thing and if going forward, it's going to be even bigger and the people that don't embrace it and jump on it miss the boat. Do you have like an 
inventory management system? Oh, yeah. We, we probably spent $1.5 million implementing a ERP package in the last year. And speaking of technology, it's been the most painful implementation we've ever made. And it was when we started, believe it or not, QuickBooks. Then we went to Peachtree. And then Peachtree crashed because it got too big. So we invested in Mass 200, which was a good package. It was probably under the $100,000 mark. And I thought it would take us 10 years, but it didn't. We started out growing it, and the system started crashing. But if any of you know what an ERP system is, it's just the it's just the whole accounting package, it's the inventory management, it's all of that. And so we had to hire a task force to come in and work with us and interview our people and find out what our needs are. And they spent six months going through that. And then we made the investment and then we cut over live. When was it, Ashley? March, cut over live on visual. And it's still painful. <laughs> I've had to hire a temporary CFO to come in and help my CFO just in the last two weeks just because there's still bugs in it. So yeah, that's technology is an ever-growing problem that you just, it's a big expense. How much education you got from the university level is It's hard to say because you're who you are because of what you do and what you've done and where you've been. But I would honestly say, if you look in my living room, I have a whole wall that's probably got 800 books in it, and I've read every one of them. I would say that's where my current, because you've got to remember, it's been 26 years since I was in college. And things have changed. Technology, procedures, everything's changed so much. And so it's ever-evolving, and you have to stay on top of it. And Really, my biggest thing, and I probably learned the most just by reading and by asking and, you know, by hiring good people. And one of the things that I did early on is I started getting larger and hiring people. I thought I had to be as smart as they did. And so I read books. Like, if you go through my library, I have books in product management, books in project management, books in, a, you know, accounting, everything. Because I wanted to be able to challenge my people and ask questions. So, and a lot of it, just emulating successful people, they do. Biographies, I've learned so much. I love the interviews on CNBC. I love to watch entrepreneurs be interviewed, you know, because you learn so much, the little tidbits. And, you know, you never know when something falls out of your mouth, you go, where did I learn that? But you just go, hmm. you pick up things along the way. Why did you choose the newspapers you did? And also with books, how do you choose? There's so many books out there. Yeah, there is. I think the reason I picked the newspapers that I picked, just because my competitors are in them. And I like to know what, what's going on in, because it affects so much of what we do, what's going on in the stock market and in the financial arenas. And I would say most of my competitors are public companies. So, you know, you just want to pick up on that kind of stuff because you just never know where a tidbit of information is going to lead you where you can get the jump on something else. It's like um, one of the lines that we launched was um, a cupcake line. And the reason that we did a cupcake line, because you know how Starbucks is really big and they're on every corner? Well, all of a sudden, these little cupcake shops are popping up on the corners. Well, that was an article in the Wall Street Journal that prompted us to do that. So yeah, I picked the newspapers for that. And then the books, I just try to really watch what's out there. And I spend so much time on airplanes. And, and I've just learned to be productive. I carry a book everywhere I go so I can pull it out and read it. So I just kind of like to stay what's on top of the, the top 10 or the top 20. I've probably read every one of them. So if something new comes out, I'll get it. And then I find certain people I love. Like I love Pat Croce. I love Tony Robbins. I love Marcus Buckingham because they're so insightful and they just have so much. I've read a, a lot of Donald Trump's and Jack Welch's books. Jack Welch was a great CEO in the day of GE. So, you know, just successful people, they're different books. And even if you just cling just a little bit out of it, you know, you never know where it'll come in. But that's kind of how I pick what I read. And then I try to be a little balanced across categories, but yeah, mostly business books. I'd say 99% of what I read is business books. Um, in the beginning, when you just started at the mall, in your little shop, what gave you the confidence to jump into business after you've been at a mom, at home, at the farm, and had kids? Like, you know what? I have been asked that question so many times, and it's so funny because you know how you just have that one moment that you're never going to forget in your life so go back to ninth grade okay 
and I was five foot eight in fifth grade. Okay, slow to puberty. Okay, ninth grade, still not in puberty. So I'm the tallest girl in the school. I have no, you know, chest, and I just thought I was a lerp. And I remember being so in love with this boy. Okay, I had this total crush on this guy. And I remember uh, it was a girl's choice dance at the junior high. And I remember at dinner time saying to my dad, I want to ask Nathan to this dance, but Michelle's going to ask him. And my dad said something that has stuck with me to this day. He said, what does she have that you don't? And, you know, I don't know. It was weird. It just kind of snapped in me. And I asked Nathan to the dance. And you know what? He went with Michelle. But it was a turning point <laughs> for me. <laughs> so, you know, it was just one of those things. I'm like, you know what? I can do it, and I'm going to do it. And if you fall, so what? You get down, you fall down, you get up, you move on. Because you know what? That's what life's all about. It's making mistakes, it's learning from them, and it's moving on. And it's just, I guess I've always, since that point, not really been afraid. There ha there's been times where, like I said, after I signed the lease, I laid in bed and my knees shaked, and I'm like, I have just signed a half a million dollar lease because my rent was five grand a month. I signed a 10-year lease, and I'm like, how am I going to pay for this if it doesn't work? So, yeah, there's been times. But I guess where there's a will, there's a way. We done? Okay. Good. Thank you. Thank you so much. You bet. Have a good day for that. Ah, thank you. Thank you. You bet. So we have some catalogs in the back the girls can hand you out as you go. Um, I didn't know there were going to be this many in, so I think I, we only brought 50, I think. We might not have enough. So if you don't want one, don't take it, but if you do, they've got them in the back.